Let's say welcome to church, everybody. We just had a fantastic Mandarin session. So you guys better not be sleepy, huh? Hopefully you guys are livelier. The music was louder, so you better be louder. Okay, we had a brilliant time at our Mandarin service just now. Just turn to your neighbor and say, you've got a divine appointment today. Say that again, turn to your neighbor, the other neighbor and say, you've got a divine appointment today. See, that is the attitude in which we should show up in church every Sunday. I tell you why. How we show up is how much we are going to receive. How we show up determines how much you're going to receive on a Sunday. Okay? Let me give you an example, an illustration. If the king, our Agong, or may, maybe Dr. Tun, sent you an invitation to his house today, okay? How would you go? You would dress your best, smell your best. You will ensure that your Saturday night is spent early so that you don't fall asleep in the king's presence. Yeah. Are, you, are you listening to me? Yeah. You won't be thinking about Bakute yeah. when he's speaking. You're going to be all attentive and you'll tell all your friends about it. I got a divine appointment. Appointment by royalty, not divine, royalty. Today, you've got an appointment by the king of kings. Can I preach the truth today? Yes. I thank God you all are dressed your best. Some of you are smelling your best. Some. The rest of you are a bit questionable, but all okay. All good. I'm glad that you came to receive today. You're in the presence of an almighty God in the house of the king of kings. So you should expect to receive something. Yeah. Amen? Amen? I'm calling my, my, my message today the theorem of disconnectivity. I chose a very comprehensive title just to sound important. It's actually, you know, just, just a makeshift, just to, to make it look gumpa a bit, like, you know, to put some effect to it. So I called it the theorem of disconnectivity. So don't worry too much about the title. We'll talk about it later at the end. Actually, it's very important, the word disconnectivity. At the end, we'll talk about it. But I'm here to tell you today that relationships is a God thing. Yeah. Do you agree? Yeah. We are on this series, you heard Pastor Stella and Pastor Joe been preaching for the past few weeks, and Pastor Noel as well, on relationships. Pastor Stella spoke a few weeks ago, I believe, about the role of a woman, yes? Yeah. And Pastor Joe spoke about the role of a man. Yeah. I'm not here to tell you either one, but I'm here to talk to you about relationships. Relationships in general, I'm not just talking about romantic relationships, but we are on this theme of relationships at this season in our church. I'm not just talking about romantic relationships, but listen, relationships were designed by God. Do you believe that? Yeah. If you don't, by the end of the sermon, I hope you do. Like I said, I'm not just talking about romantic relationships, I'm talking about parent-child relationships, friends and siblings, pastor and congregation, CG leader and CG members. I'm talking about business partnership. I'm talking about your relationships with your job, with your money, with your house, with your country. I'm talking about relationships in general. And relationships is a God thing. Turn to your neighbor and say, relationship is a God thing. In fact, relationship is one of God's most important plans. Try telling it to Joe again. He needs to hear this. Relationships is one of God's most important plans. In fact, the main reason, the only reason He created you and I was for the purpose of relationship. He didn't create human beings because He had nothing to do on the eighth day. He created human beings to have a relationship with us. To have a walking, talking, working relationship. You know, throughout the Bible you'll find God calling us his friends. We sang the song just now, I am a friend of God. He's a relational God. He calls us his friend. He calls us his companion. He calls us his, his, his sons and his daughters. He's a relational God. In fact, the whole reason that Christ died on the cross, the whole Good Friday and Resurrection Sunday story, the whole reason Jesus Christ died on the cross and rose again was to restore our relationship with Almighty God. See, the reason that the devil came to the Garden of Eden 
the reason the devil came to the Garden of Eden wasn't to, to disappoint men and women, okay, or wasn't to take charge of the Garden. He came to break the relationship that regular man had with Holy God. So he did it by bringing in sin. And because of sin, our connection, our relationship with God was broken. And that is why Christ had to come to restore that connection. Christ didn't come so that we could have a free ticket to heaven. Having that free ticket to the kingdom of heaven is a result of our relationship with the king. Are you hearing me? Let's look at 2 Corinthians 5, 17 to 19. It says, it's, therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. The old has gone and the new is here. All this is from God who reconciled us to himself through Christ and gave us the ministry of reconciliation. You all allowed me to speak the truth, right? So I'm going to preach the truth. Let me tell you something. Truth is a very difficult thing to get in this world today, in this day and age. And it should be coming from the church. But sadly, churches are afraid to speak the truth on a platform like this. You know why? You'll be labeled as a hater. So what we do, we, we sugarcoat the truth. We water down the truth. Don't talk about gay rights, you know, people get offended. We are so afraid to talk, to tell people the truth. Because people might get offended. But let me tell you something. The Bible says this. It is the knowledge of the truth. You shall know the truth. Not you shall know the watered down version of the truth. You shall know the truth and the truth shall set you free. But, but pastor, we shouldn't speak you know, directly because we, if we are too direct with the truth, then we might offend them and they cannot be free. Are you lying? You are a liar. You are listening to the devil. It's only by the truth, nothing but the truth, people can be set free. And I can guarantee you on this platform in C3 Klang and C3 Kuala Lumpur, you will get the truth from this platform. So I'm going to preach the truth today, right? Yeah. He gave us the ministry of what? He gave us the ministry of reconciliation, not the ministry of gossip and separation. Yeah. Stop looking at your neighbor. Anand, stop looking at Nisha. Stop it. He gave us the ministry of reconciliation. That means it is our duty to, to mend relationships and to reconcile them. Not to separate them through gossip, which the church is very fond of doing. Let's look at the word relationship. Relationship means this. The way in which two or more people or things are connected. In other words, the state of being connected. See, in the Garden of Eden, our relationship with Almighty God was severed, severed, cut off because of sin. What is another word for severed connection? Disconnection. All right? Connection and disconnection are the essence of relationships. Now, we all, it's easy for us to process that connections is a God thing. Because it's positive. Connections is a God thing. But because of what happened in the Garden of Eden, we automatically process that because connection is a God thing, then disconnection has to come from the devil. Disconnection is a bad thing. It's a negative thing. And it's from the devil. I'm here today to tell you that neither connection nor disconnection belongs to the devil. We give the devil too much credit. The devil doesn't own anything. He doesn't even own hell. He's going to hell. The Bible says he will be cast into the lake of fire. Stop giving the devil credit. He does not own disconnections. Yeah. Connection and disconnection is a Bible word. Disconnection is a Bible word. It is God's plan as well. But, but we just talked about the Garden of Eden. How can that be God's plan? The devil came and disconnected us from God. How can that be a positive thing? This is what the devil does. He takes what is meant for good and he corrupts it. He corrupts your disconnections as much as he corrupts your connections. How? He connects you to the wrong kind of people and he disconnects you from the right kind of people. Yeah. I say that again. He connects you to the wrong people. He disconnects you from the right people. Today, we need to 
Listen to what God is saying on how to connect with the right people and disconnect from the wrong ones. Are you ready? Now, I wish we had a lot of time to go through godly connections and disconnections. You know that godly connections are very important. Making right business decisions, making right decisions on who you need to marry, very important. Very, very important. Stephen, very important. Don't just marry anybody. The decision is, but I'm not going to talk about that today, unfortunately. Come another time. We're going to be talking about disconnections. Why? Because disconnections is the frown upon word. It's hardly spoken about because it's, it's so ifish, it's so negative. I just don't like it. It gives me the EBGB. So I don't want to think so much about breaking up or disconnections. You know, saying goodbye is, is uncomfortable. But let me tell you, disconnection is a Bible word. And I'll show you from scripture today. Are you ready? I'm going to give you three principles, just three, in which I hope if you apply, you will see how your life begins to thrive or move towards the next level. That is our theme this year, to thrive. And in order to thrive, we need to be moving forward and upward. Some of us are stagnant. We need to know why. Okay? Number one, principle number one, this connection is necessary in order for a new connection to happen. Now, it's some Bible study time. Don't zone out and don't sleep off. I'm not talking about marriage. I'm going to give you scripture about marriage. But I'm not talking about marriage. I'm going to use that scripture to bring about a principle. Okay, so pay attention. It'll be slow for a while, but you'll get it. Amen? Amen. Ephesians 5.31 For this reason, a man shall leave his father and mother and shall be joined to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh. See, in the context of marriage, in the context of the scripture, a man must, needs, it's not suggested, it has to happen. He must disconnect from his father's household in order to connect with his wife, which is the new connection. He needs to disconnect. As long as he stays connected to his father's household, he can never lead his own. He must disconnect to connect. We need to disconnect from here to connect there. Are you hearing me? Yes. For this reason, a man and his wife shall leave, a man shall leave his father and mother to be joined to his wife. You see, among all relationships on earth, the relationship between a husband and a wife is the most intimate relationship after your relationship with God. The most intimate, even more intimate than a parent-child relationship. God designed it this way. Therefore, in order for this man to be connected, to have that intimacy with this new connection called the wife, he has to let go of his current connection so he can be connected to his future. So this scripture, let's look a little bit about the new connection, the wife, right? Let's talk about the new connection. We need to know what the new connection is. I'm bringing about a principle now, pay attention. This scripture was originally written in Genesis 2. This was Paul quoting this scripture when he was talking to the congregation about marriages. But this scripture was originally written in Genesis 2.24, the exact same thing. It is when God spoke it. And God said it after he created Eve. So you heard Pastor Stella's message a few, few weeks ago about how Eve was created to be Adam's slave. You all are paying attention. He was never, she was never created to be Adam's maid. Never created to be Adam's slave. If Adam was an Indian man, it will be a different story. <laughs> Eve was created from his side, meaning she was meant to be his help. She was meant to compensate where he lacked. As cliche as it may sound, she completed him. The new connection is designed to compensate you where you lack. The new connection is designed to complete you and to help you and to assist you in your next step or next chapter of your life. But as long as you're staying connected here, you cannot connect there. For some of us, the, our new connection is just around the corner. But we are so comfortable where we are, we don't want to disconnect because it's discomforting. And so we lose out on that, dis, that new connection. And because of that, we never get to where we are. Let's look at this a little bit more. For this reason, a man shall leave. 
See, the word leave his father and mother here doesn't have to be a negative thing. Because of the thing that happened in the Garden of Eden, the word leave here has become a negative word. See, the word leave here in the Hebrew context means katalepo. Katalepo is a word, the Hebrew word that describes leave, which actually means to shift. To shift. So it does not mean that the man now, because he leaves his father and mother to be with his wife, now he and his father and mother, he and his parents have become strangers. Or he hates his parents now. Or they cannot relate anymore. They are nobodies to him. It, they, he stops honoring them. It does not mean that at all. That's what the devil wants you to think. What it means is, there is a shift of devotion, of loyalty, and of priority from the parents household to the wife that's a shift but he the parents will always be the man's parents the parents will always be honored as his father and mother it just that there is a shift of loyalty of priority and of devotion now that's what it means to leave so it's not a negative thing but either way disconnection from your current i'm not talking about disconnecting from your past that's a different story Disconnecting from your current is necessary in order for you to connect to your future. Disconnection is necessary in order for a new connection to happen. Number two, when I give you the illustration, you will understand later. Number two, disconnection is necessary in order for God's promises to be fulfilled. Let's look at Genesis 12, 1 to 3. The Lord said to Abram, this is before Genesis 12, 1 to 3. The Lord said to Abraham, this is before God changed Abraham's name to Abraham. Okay? It's not a spelling mistake for those who do not know your Bible. The Lord has said to Abraham, what does he start off saying? What's that word? What's that word? Leave your native country, your relatives, your father's family, and go to the land that I will show you. Just put a note on that for a while. We'll come back to that. And then he goes on to list down the blessing. I will make you into a great nation. In other translations, it says, I will make you the father of nations. I will bless you and make you famous. Other translations, it says, I will make your name great. You will be a blessing to others. I will bless those who bless you and curse those who curse you. How many of you want that kind of things? How many of you want that kind of a blessing from God? Huh? What was the prerequisite here? What was the condition? In order for these blessings to be fulfilled in Abraham's life, what did Abraham need to do? He needed to leave. He needed to disconnect. He needed to disconnect from his place of comfort, his place of security, his place of familiarity, his place of predictability. He needed to disconnect to connect to his future. Disconnect from his current to connect to his future. Almost similar from the first point, but there's a slight difference here. See, when God wants to get you to your next step in your life, he does it in these two ways. The first one we learned that the man knew who he was getting, what he was getting into. Well, kind of. Most married men know we actually didn't know what we were getting into until it happened. Right? And then we're still wondering. It was the best thing that ever happened, love. That's what I'm trying to say. My goodness. So far, so quick to judge. The best thing. We didn't know how great it was. So. He knew there was a new connection already painted out for him. He knew that he needed to leave his father's house to get connected to this new connection, right? Yeah. But in Abraham's case, he said, you leave your native country, your father's house and all that to the land I will show you. Meaning, this is a higher level of faith kind of disconnection because you have no idea where you're going to. And I find that God prefers to use this most of the time, especially in my life. Sometimes I would prefer that He shows me the plan. Lord, where is your battle plan? Let me see. Step one, step two, step three. I would like to see. Like Peter, if I was Peter, stepping out of the boat, I would have said, okay, God, so when I step out, what's going to happen? Show me the calculations. I mean, 
Jesus was a little bit of a scientist. He can do the calculations. I may not understand it, but as long as he draws, out, draws it out for me, tells me that I'm going to walk on water, I'll walk on water, no problem. But you see, Peter didn't even know he was going to walk on water. He didn't know what to expect. He didn't know a big, whether a big whale was going to eat him up. But he came out anyway. And that's the kind of thing that God is asking Abraham to do. To the land that I will show you. I'm prophetically saying something to somebody today. That God wants to make your name great. He wants to make you a blessing. That you will go to the land and be a blessing to others that you never thought you could be. That you will be, He will bless those who bless you and He will curse those who curse you. He will make you into a great nation. But in order for you to get there, you need to disconnect from here, even though you do not know where there is. Trusting God. Number three, principle number three. Disconnection is necessary for greater revelation, authority, and power to be released. I say that again. Disconnection is necessary for greater revelation, authority, and power to be released. Let's look at John 16 verse 7. This is Jesus talking to his disciples after the resurrection. Just before Jesus ascends into heaven, this is his last conversation with his disciples. So put yourself in the disciples' shoes right now, right? Uh, read that later. Look at me. Put yourself in the disciples' shoes right now. Imagine, they've walked three years, three full years, I almost said 30 years. They've walked three full years with Jesus before his death and resurrection. And what happened when he was crucified? They ran, right? Okay. But now, now can you imagine they are walking with resurrected Jesus? Can you imagine how cool that is? Okay, now this is resurrected Jesus with the wounds and all and his Gucci jeans and the disciples are walking with them. They, they were walking like that. They were, they were comfortable. They thought, this is it. We are going to change the world. We are going to go into India. Thomas, go into India, build the Martama Church. We are going to go and we are going to win the world. Because as long as we've got resurrected Jesus by our side. And then Jesus has this conversation with him before he leaves. Nevertheless, I tell you the truth. He's talking to his disciples. It is to your advantage that I go away. For if I do not go, the helper will not come. The helper talks about the Holy Spirit. If I do not go, the helper will not come. Can you imagine how mind-boggling this is if you're in the disciples' shoes? What are you talking, the helper? You are here resurrected Jesus but he's saying look the greater things to be given to you but it only can be done it only can happen if this current state of affairs is disconnected we have to disconnect so you can connect to what's coming so the Holy Spirit can come and just few chap few verses down six verses down from verse 7 we jump to verse 13 it says this so Jesus is telling them what happens when the helper comes. When he, the spirit of truth, comes, he will guide you into all truth. This is talking about the greater revelation of the truth. Greater revel revelation of the truth. So God is, uh, Jesus is telling his disciples, look, when this disconnection happens, it must happen so that when you're connected to the helper, you will have a deeper revelation of the truth. And then future, few verses down, in verse 24, it says this. I tell you the truth. You will ask the Father directly, and He will grant you your request, because you use my name. You have not done this before. Ask using my name, and you will receive, and you will have abundant joy. This talks about the greater authority that will come with your new connection. Am I speaking to somebody today? And in just two chapters before this, Jesus was talking to the disciples as well. In John chapter 14, he says this, Very truly I tell you, whoever believes in me will do the works I have been doing, and they will do even greater things than this, because, everybody say because, because. I am going to be with the Father. Talking about the power. There's a greater revelation of truth greater authority and greater power that God is waiting to release over your life 
only if you learn to disconnect from the current and connect to the new. God wants to do a new thing. Turn to your neighbor and say, God wants to do a new thing. God is not psycho. He doesn't like doing the same things over and over again, expecting different results. Okay? He doesn't like to sing the same old song. That's why we sang a new song today, which was actually an old song, which was modified and made new, but it's a new song. Sing unto the Lord a new song, the Bible says. God wants to do a new thing in somebody's life today, and He wants to release greater authority. He wants to release greater power. He wants to, re he wants to bless you and make your name great. He wants to release more truth into your life. He wants, he's got somebody designed for you or something or somewhere designed to compensate you to take you from point A to point B. But you need to disconnect from the current so you can connect to your future. But this connection, this connecting is discomforting, isn't it? How many of you know that it's also sometimes painful? Don't, don't cry now, Kumar. Kumar just recently been through a disconnecting moment. Four years ago, you broke up. <laughs> we are afraid of the discomforting feeling in disconnecting. And so we forego our future because we are afraid to disconnect. You see, not everyone or everything is meant to be in our lives forever. Yeah. The people whom you thought will be there with you all the way are a stranger today. Yeah. The only relationship, not your BFFs. Now I know some of you got BFFs, your best friends for life. Let me tell you something. The only relationship that God allowed to last a lifetime is a relationship between a husband and a wife. And even in that relationship, there is a time to disconnect. Till death do you part. In every other relationship, it was never meant to last a lifetime. Sad, huh? Hard to say goodbye. But let me tell you why. Some people in your life are designed to take you from point A to point B. And from point A to point B, they compensate you where you lack. From point A to point B, they are your assistants. From point A to point B, they are your stepping stone. But from point B to point C, they become your hindrance. Just as you are in somebody's life. You may have helped somebody you may have been the greatest influence to somebody to get him from point A to B, C, D, and E. But from there on, you are now a hindrance. We need to know when it's time to disconnect. Turn to your neighbor and say, it's time to disconnect. Turn to your other neighbor and say, you will not be with me forever. Except if you're sitting with your husband and wife. Except that. All the husbands quickly. You will not be with me for... I'm going to give you an illustration to bring all the points together, which will help you understand. Okay? This is a very important principle. A lot of people are losing out on what God has in store for them because we find it hard to disconnect. We find it... We don't want to say goodbye to the things we know we need to say goodbye to. We keep resurrecting some things that are dead. God meant for some things to be resurrected and most things to remain dead. That's why there's one Jesus and many others that are dead. <laughs> Let me give you an illustration. How many of you are familiar with the... Uh, who's the coordinator? Any until what time do I have? 12.30. 12.20, okay, excellent. So... How many of you have taken the LRT or MRT or monorail around KL, PJ area? You're all familiar? Brilliant. Oh, okay, brilliant. So if I'm wrong with the route, forget, don't worry about it. Don't, don't correct me or whatever. Just, just play along because I'm trying to get a point across because I've never traveled in this route in a long time. So maybe they changed it, a new train or something. There's always a new tunnel and a new train. You know, a lot of budget we have. Now it's being cut. 
Okay? So, imagine you are staying in Subang Jaya. Okay? You are staying in Subang Jaya. You are working in, what's the place? Times Square. And then you've got a bunch of friends, buddies, close buddies, best friends, who are also staying in Subang Jaya, but they work in KLCC. So in the same province, around the same area, almost similar route, but two different destinations. Okay, let's talk about you first. In order for you to get from Subang Jaya to Times Square, you got to get on board the LRT in Subang Jaya, now there's LRT in Subang there, right? SS15 stop, brilliant. No more commuter, slow train. Get on the LRT in Subang Jaya, ride it all the way to KL Central, from KL Central take the monorail all the way to Times Square, and you're in Times Square. But before, at KL Central, before getting onto the monorail, what is the one most important thing you need to do? It's not a trick question. You got to get off the LRT. As long as you stay on the LRT, you can't get on the monorail. Make sense? Yeah. It's not a scientific, I said it's not a trick question. It's not, you don't need three brain cells to figure that out. If you want to get on the monorail, you got to get off the LRT to get on the monorail. Make sense? Yeah. Okay. Now let's talk about your friends. In order for them to get to KLCC from Subang, they get on the LRT in Subang, they ride it, to KL Central, they don't need to get off. They ride it, continue riding it all the way to KLCC and then they get off. Yeah. Right? Okay. Now I'm going to give you three scenarios based on that story. Three scenarios in which I hope that you will identify your life in either one or all three and, and see if you can find a fix in there. Okay? Scenario number one. You and your buddies get on board the LRT in Subang. At 6.30 in the morning, it's cold, it's nice. Now you are going where again? Times Square. Your friends are going where? KLCC. KLCC. So you get on the LRT and you ride it all the way to KL Central. From Subang to KL Central, you and your buddies get into this intense bromance kind of conversation where it's so deep, even God needs a translator. It's so deep, Google Translate failed. Okay, you got into this really good conversation and you've kept each other warm. Not, not, in, a, not in a CC kind of way. I mean, you know, speaking the truth, you see. From KL, sorry, from Subang to KL Central, you got into this intense conversation. Now you've reached your interval stop. You need to get what? Get off. Then you can get on the monorail. But you decide. This conversation was too good. The disconnecting and to say bye-bye is just so discomforting. I mean, I cannot bear to say goodbye to my buddies. So you know what? You decide to stay on and not get off at KL Central. And you ride the LRT all the way to KLCC with your buddies, and then a the lot of you get off at KLCC. How many of you know you can still get to monorail, as you can still get to Times Square from KLCC? Probably take a grab car, or still ride on the monorail, or the free shuttle service or whatever. But it would have delayed your time. Not only that, you would have, it would have cost you more. What am I trying to say? Either way, you are going to be faced with a choice to make to disconnect. But if you choose to do it sooner, you reach your destination quicker, with less spent. Less resources spent. But if you decide, you know what, I'm too, com too comfortable here, I wait. Eventually, you're going to have to learn to disconnect. But you'll end up delaying your promise. Delaying the fulfillment of God's promise in your life. Making sense? Yeah. Scenario number two. A continuation from scenario number one. Because you decided to stay on the LRT at KL Central, your friends found it so warm and so loving. They thought, my goodness, this guy is the apple of my eye. I mean, he decided not to get off when he should have. 
The sacrifice that he has made for me, the buddies are thinking now, we should repay. So when the whole lot of you reach KLCC, now they decided they are not getting off as well. So all of you decided we love each other too much to get off. So you stay on the LRT, what happens? You end up going around in circles, living your life in the same cycle over and over again. And a lot of you never reach your destination. Scenario number three. Same story. You decided not to get off. You stayed on the train, the LRC, with your buddies all the way to KLCC. Now at KLCC, you expected your buddies would sacrifice for you like they did in scenario two. Because you paid the price. You gave up everything to be with your friends, with your buddies. And they decided, we've got to go to work. So we are at our stop. And they get off. And this offends you or hurts you. Because you paid the price. And you were expecting them to pay the price as well. And so because of that, you show a tantrum and you stay where you are. You build a wall. They're gone, but you stay where you are. What happens? You end up living your life in that same cycle over and over again. Being bitter and reminiscing, thinking about the good old days. My, the good old days were good. While everybody else have moved on and reached their destination. This connection is necessary. Some of us, some of us here are at our interval stops. The monorail is waiting. All we need to do is to get off where we are so we can get on to where we need to be. But because we are stuck in our comfort area, our secure area, our area of good old days. Or we've sat in that cycle too long and grew too bitter to get up and move. I'm here to tell you today, church, this connection is necessary. Joseph Campbell, an American scholar, said this. Anybody knows who Joseph Campbell is? Joseph Campbell is the guy who single-handedly influenced George Lucas. Anybody knows who George Lucas is? The guy who created all the Star Wars films, in which one of our Jedi is preaching in KL Church today, in Sitri Kuala Lumpur. Sorry, not one of the... He's, is he a Jedi or Yoda? Or he's, the, he's the Bing, the Jaja Bing. Sith. <laughs> all right? This guy single-handedly influenced the Star Wars films through George Lucas because of, uh, he's an American scholar on myth and methodologies. And he said this, we must be willing to let go of the life we've planned so as to have the life that is waiting for us. See, we are all destined for greatness. You and I all, all, everybody say all. all. Turn to your neighbor and say, I'm destined for greatness. Turn to your neighbor again and say, you are destined for greatness. We are all destined for greatness, not just a chosen few. Because God came to give you and I life in abundance. Jesus said, I came to give you life and life in abundance. Life to the full. We were all meant to live life to the brim, to the full, to the maximum. We were all destined. We are all destined for greatness. But only the few who master the art of connection and disconnection will reach there. Because if we decide to, oh, I don't want to have anything to do with connection or disconnection, which is the essence of our whole creation and our whole being, we will never make it to our destination. Amen? Make sense? Let me get the keyboards up. But before we leave today, actually the whole band can come up. But the band pay attention as well, huh? Come on. Before we close today, I need to give you like a disclaimer. Or I'm going to point out a few hints on how to know when it's time to disconnect. You all want to know that? How to know when it's time to disconnect? Just a few hints. 
Because if I do not give you these hints, then you'll take my word, that the word that you received today, and use it against me. Some of you are waiting to break up with your girlfriends. Or your boyfriends. And you'll go home and say, baby, I heard from God, baby. Baby, God spoke to me. Touched my heart. The songs were in line. Baby, I've got to go. And then there's the other group of people. Pastor Noel corrected you last week. Or Pastor Joe corrected you last month. So you're efficient about the church now. There's no love. No love in this church. And you're waiting for the office to open on Tuesday to say, Pastor Joe. So Pastor Nesa and said, God spoke to me, you know, Pastor. It's time to disconnect. <laughs> Listen, I need to give you, I need to give you these hints. So please do not use this word against me. Just six hints. Number one. And this is the most important thing. It's not up there. Being offended is not, I say that again, being offended is not a sign that you should disconnect. If you're offended, the only thing you need to do is get out of offense. I tell you why. The devil, we, we, uh, we give the devil too much credit. We think he's too powerful because of Hollywood. We watch the Da Vinci Code and what's it, what's it, what's it, Emily Rose, Emily Rose at the movie. Yeah. And uh, what's the Conjuring, it's rubbish movies and we think, oh my goodness, the devil is so powerful. He's coming for me, he's got my mommy. For some of you it may be true, but listen. <laughs> he's coming for me, he's got my auntie. That one is true for almost a lot of people. The devil only has two weapons. You know, Kim Jong-un told the US that he's got one button. And Mr. Trump said, I've got two. The enemy, the devil, only has two buttons to press. The first button is he uses blindness to keep you from God. He keeps you blind so you cannot see that God, that Jesus is the way, truth and life. But once that blindness is gone and you've seen the light, you cannot unsee the light. He can never use blindness on you today again because you have already moved into the light. You have already seen the truth. So he needs to get, he needs to use another weapon, his other button to get you out. One button, blindness to keep you from, another button to get you out. And that button is called offense. If he can get you offended, he will get you connected to the wrong people and disconnected from the right ones. So offense is a very dangerous thing. It's not something that we should sweep under the carpet and not deal with. Because the more we keep it, the more it grows. Offense needs to be dealt with. And how do you deal with offense? Come up for prayer. <laughs> Listen, the man of God can come from Africa, India and South America, lay his hands on you, headbutt you and lay his legs on you. Offense is your choice. Offense is not given, it is taken. I can come up to you and say something so offensive, but it is up to you to take it or to discard it. Offense is in your power, in your authority, whether to reject it or to accept it. So number one, being offended is not a sign that you should disconnect. Now, for the signs that you should disconnect, you are constantly being put down and ridiculed in front of others. Now again, if you are offended, you will think that this is you. So if you find that all the six that I mentioned is you, you are probably offended. Number three, you are const you're constantly having to compromise your stance and values to keep up in that relationship. Young people, I know it's the 21st century, but I want to speak the truth, right? Sex has become so cheap in the world today. What is the, what is the cycle of dating these days? Sex first. The sex was good, we determine whether we should go for a second date. The devil corrupts what God meant to be beautiful. Sex was meant to be in marriage. It was supposed to happen in the context of marriage 
and the cycle was supposed to be date first. Married, sex, children. How is it today? Sex first, date. And then later, I love you. And after that, we move in. Wow, an achievement. And marriage is the last we even think about. We even adopt kids first. That's why same-sex marriages are allowed because we can adopt kids now. The whole essence of marriage is gone. Because we keep lowering our standards, compromising our standards so that we don't be labeled as a hater in this world. So that we don't, you know, we keep that relationship. It's time for you to say goodbye to that relationship. Number four, you're constantly being drained. Number five, there is never ending drama. Now be careful. You may be the drama. Finally, persistent unreliability. Now, I only can give you a few hints. At the end of the day, you need to go back to the Word of God. Have your own walk with God. Read your own Bible. But the Bible also says, seek wise counsel. You heard? Heard what I said? Seek wise counsel. And go back to your Bible. Stop googling what to do with your life. There's a lot of Christians of today. We are relying on the information on the internet. Internet is good for research. Not at all for your Christian walk. Stop googling. What is God's purpose for my life, Google? When you want to fix your washing machine or learn about the functionalities of your washing machine, you don't read the manual of your fridge. Yes? You need to go back to your manual, which is the Bible. The Bible in this app. The Bible. Okay? Not your internet. And you need to seek wise counsel. Let me ask you this question. Where does wisdom come from, church? Let me tell you this. Wisdom does not come from Zakir. Zak, Zakar. Zakir. What's it? I must not say it wrong. Zakir Nae. Oh, very wrong word. Ayo, it's recorded. Ayo, Jesus. Through it all. Zakir Nae. Wisdom does not come from that fellow. Wisdom does not come from Lillian 2 or Lillian 3 or Lillian version 4.0. Wisdom, wisdom comes from who? From God. Which means the person you are seeking counsel from has to be in God to give you wise counsel. But I've seen so many Christians, oh my goodness, help them Jesus, sitting down with their BFFs. Woo! Their BFFs who are of a different religion, of a different belief. Do not believe in Christ. Do not believe in the existence of God and they're getting counsel about what to do in their marriage. Or counsel about what to do with their relationship between their pastor and them. Or they had a conflict in church. Wise counsel, please. That's what the Bible says. Let's look at Proverbs chapter 12, verse 15. The way of a fool is right in his own eyes, but a wise man listens to advice. Don't be a fool. Listen to advice. Proverbs 19.20 Listen to advice and accept what? Oy. Oh, yo, why must this be in the Bible? Listen to advice, okay lah. Accept discipline. It's accept discipline, not accept discipline. Know your spelling, huh? and at the end you'll be counted among the wise. But we are so easily offended. Your leader corrects you, even though your leader may be wrong sometimes. But if he corrects you, you get offended. I've been on this earth huh? 34 years. You want to tell me what to do? Our prime minister is 93 years old, and he has got a council of elders to counsel him. So shut up. Stop being stupidly offended for no reason. Grow the church. Reach people, love people, serve people. 
Stop getting offended with your leaders. Oh, you know, say like that to me, ah, Noel, I tell you, ah, it's Pastor Noel, ah. You, know, you cannot sing, but he told me I was singing off key. <laughs> Proverbs 11, verse 14. Where there is no counsel, the people fall. But in the multitude of counselors, there is safety. Let's look at the title of my message again. The Theorem of Disconnectivity. The word disconnectivity comes from the word disconnective. It means to hold the power or the function to disconnect. Just as the flip side of it is connective, which means the, to hold the power and the function to connect. What am I trying to say? Every connection and disconnection in your life and my life does not happen automatically. It happens either because we deliberately decided to or we've done a series of things that led to that connection or disconnection. Either way, connection and disconnection is your choice. You can't come up in front and hope that a touch from a man of God will help you disconnect or connect. You got to decide to disconnect. You got to decide to connect. Let's stand.